Good evening. I hope everyone is doing good. I will have to say this to get it out of the way. Uh, what a strange time it's been these past few weeks. I really miss seeing my church family uh, and, and seeing the kids in Awana, and I really look forward to being back. Uh, it has been awesome to be able to be part of our church uh, through the streaming content, uh, through YouTube and Facebook, and I really want to thank all those involved. Uh, I've been looking forward to doing this lesson for the children, and I appreciate Pastor Jess, Jeff giving me the opportunity to teach. Today's lesson will be on Jesus in the alabaster box. So kids, get ready, get your Bibles out, and turn to Luke chapter 7, verse 36. Luke chapter 7, verse 36. Well, we are in the middle of spring now, and it's quite a cold spring. I, I know that I'm ready for warmer weather, for the rain to stop. Um, I want summer to come and warmer weather. Uh, I want to be able to go outside. I want to go hiking. I want to go camping. I um, want to do the things that you do, go swimming during good weather. Uh, and in good weather, you're able to wear sandals, and uh, I know that I used to wear sandals all the time. Uh, my wife and my girls, they pretty much wear sandals throughout the whole summer. Uh, in the Bible times, wearing sandals was a very common thing. While we usually just wear sandals here in, in our time, we usually wear them when the weather's nice, um, it's, it's warm outside, uh, in, in good conditions is when we normally wear them. But people back in the Bible times, they wear them pretty much all the time. They didn't have a pair of Nike tennis shoes or, or some muck boots uh, from Tractor Supply to slip on for when the ground was muddy. Uh, they also had very dusty streets, um, and animals were usually around just about everywhere uh, because that's how they traveled. And as you can imagine, their, their feet got pretty nasty in the process, and they probably had some pretty stinky feet. Um, but in those days... If I were to invite you to my house for dinner, the very first thing I would do is give you a kiss on the cheek. That's not going to happen if you come over to my house now, I assure you. Uh, but then I would um, either uh, give you water to wash your feet, or I would ask a servant to, to wash your feet for you. Now, if you were a very important guest, I might wash your feet myself. Can you imagine Mr. Brandon washing your feet? Um, then I would give you some perfumed ointment to put on your head in case you were hot and sweaty. Uh, in today's lesson, Jesus was invited to someone's house. He was invited for dinner, uh, for a meal, and we're going to find out what happened today. So again, turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 7, and we're going to start in verse 36. Let's go ahead and read that. i read that together. Luke 7, verse 36. And one of the Pharisees desired him, Jesus, that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment, and stood at his feet behind him weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee, which had bidden him, saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he said, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors, the one owed fifty hundred pence and the other fifty. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he... To whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house, thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. And when they sat at meat with him, 
Uh, and they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he said to the woman, Thy faith hath, hath saved thee. Go in peace. So we're going to dive into that story, to this account in the Bible and talk about uh, what happened. So we, it talks about Simon the Pharisee. One of the Pharisees decided, uh, desired him that he would eat with him. Who was a Pharisee? If you're not sure what a Pharisee is, uh, they were religious men back in the Bible times, and they liked to obey lots of rules. They obeyed all the rules of the Old Testament. Not only that, they obeyed rules that other religious people made up. They also kind of made up their own rules and followed them. Now, following rules is, is a good thing. We must not forget that. But if we become what's called legalistic and follow rules according to our pride uh, rather than according to God, that's when it becomes bad. They were following the rules and banking on those rules and following them to get them to heaven. While we should follow God's law, we also must understand that there is grace given to us as sinners, and it is so much better to follow God in his mercy and grace rather than just the rules. Pharisees talk so much about obeying rules that they forgot to think about God. They thought that all the rules were more important than God. They thought that rules were more important than people too, as we'll see uh, what this uh, Pharisee thought of, uh, thought of this woman. They did not like anyone uh, who did not obey the rules just like them. They thought that everyone should be like them. Jesus met a Pharisee named Simon. Simon invited Jesus to, over to his house to have dinner, which we, we've all done before. Um, it's nice to have people over, and it would certainly be nice to have someone over now, but uh, we're all kind of um, hunkered down at home. Um, it would be so nice to be able to have cookouts during the summer when, when the COVID uh, pandemic uh, goes uh, dies down and we're able to uh, go out in the battle. It would be so wonderful and be great to be back in church. I'm looking forward to it. But when Jesus arrived at Simon's house, Simon didn't give him a kiss. He did not give Jesus water to wash his feet with. He didn't offer Jesus perfume to put on his head. How sad. There's really no more important uh, uh, person <laughs> that would be at your house than the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and he definitely should have been an honored guest. But uh, Jesus came into the home anyway, of course, uh, and other important guests were eating with Simon as well. And you also got to remember um, that in the Bible times, they didn't have tables like we do. Um, they very likely had a, a small, either on the floor or like a small stool on the floor, like a, uh, where it's set up off the ground, and they kind of reclined, and they, and they almost were laying down. Um, so therefore, having feet all around, you would want those to be washed and cleaned. Um, went to make it more pleasant for the meal. Um, so, uh, but Jesus came in and he was going to eat with this man. But there was someone else that came into Simon's house. And Simon did not invite uh, this lady. This woman was kind of the opposite of a Pharisee. She didn't obey any rules. And she was a very, very sinful person. Uh, this person that came in was not someone who liked to obey the rules like Simon. This woman had actually been pre pretty bad. She had done some pretty bad things, and everyone knew that she was a sinner. Uh, can you imagine the gasps of the other guests, the rolling of the eyes, the whispers from the self-righteous Pharisees? Uh, you know, I wonder why she was there. We're going to find out. Uh, verse 38 tells us, And stood at his feet behind him weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. This sinful woman, and she knew that she was a sinner. Uh, we all know that we're sinners deep down inside. She did not come to see Simon. She didn't come for a, a free meal. Uh, she knew Simon would not help her. She was sorry for the bad things that she had done, and that she knew that Jesus would forgive her of her sins. Guys, that's what we all need to realize. We can't follow rules to get into heaven. We aren't, and we also were not ever too bad of a sinner. For Jesus to not save us, Jesus will save you. Turn to him and he will forgive you. While everyone was eating, the woman came and, and kneeled on the floor behind Jesus. She was very, very sorry for her sins. But she began to cry. When she saw uh, that Jesus' feet had not been washed, she used the tears from her own eyes to wash his feet. She didn't have a towel, so she used her hair to dry Jesus' feet. Then she took her jar of perfume and put it on Jesus' feet. The Bible says, 
um, that it was a, uh, that she brought an alabaster box of ointment. So I'm going to show you this box here. This is not white like an alabaster box should be, but it's the best thing I could find at the house. It does look fancy. It's actually Ava's uh, calligraphy set. It's got all kinds of fancy stuff in there. But we can pretend that this is an alabaster box full of ointment. Now, just because it says box in here, it could also be interpreted jar or vial. Um, alabaster boxes are kind of like a type of marble, um, and it could also be made out, out of other material. But the goal was to keep the perfume, um, the, the scent. Uh, some say that if it was sealed, it could, the scent could be kept for centuries. Um, but uh, they, some of them that, had, that were flasks and they could be opened, they were used more on a daily basis. And then some of them were sealed, and then they would have to be broken to be used. Um, and those were mostly used for burials. But she brought some very precious ointment in. Um, however the, uh, the jar was, or the box, she brought it in, and she put the, uh, this perfume and put it on Jesus' feet. She gave something of value that she had, and she gave it to the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a lesson there as well. Um, we also can do the same thing. Um, you know, you may not have any money, but you have time. You can give to the Lord. Um, maybe you do have money. As far as adults, we should give to the Lord um, of, of what God allows us to um, make with our jobs. Um, we can give um, our time. We can pray for people. So give what you can to the Lord. She showed him her love by giving him something and doing something for him, which is a wonderful testimony. Now, as she was doing this, weeping and washing his feet um, and showing uh, how sorry she was for sin and how much she loved Jesus, um, now you go over to Simon, and he was kind of shocked. This Pharisee could not believe what he was seeing. He thought to himself, how dare this woman come into my house? How dare Jesus let her touch him, much less wash his, wash his feet? If Jesus only knew what she had done, he wouldn't want anything to do with her. Didn't Jesus know about following the rules? Jesus must not be a true teacher. He says here that he doesn't, if he was a real prophet. Now, Simon didn't say any of this out loud. Um, he, uh, the Bible says, now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself. He was thinking these thoughts. He wasn't saying anything. But he was thinking these things to himself. Boy, I am sure glad that Jesus didn't see the woman as Simon was thinking. You know, I, I know that uh, I know that I'm very glad for that because we are all sinners that are in need of a Savior. That includes Mr. Brandon, that includes Pastor Jeff, you at home, that includes everyone. We are all sinners in need of a Savior. Thank God that He doesn't uh, that He doesn't see us that way. He sees us as someone He knows we're sinners and He wants to save us from it. Jesus could read Simon's mind. Boys and girls, he knows your thoughts. He knows Mr. Brandon's thoughts. He knows what you're thinking. So he decided to tell Simon a story. Simon, Jesus said, once two men borrowed money, one borrowed 500 pence, we'll call it dollars, $500, and the other $50. So one borrowed 500, one borrowed 50. To me, both of them are a lot of money, right? But uh, definitely 500 is more. Um, after a while, the lender told the men that they did not have to pay him back. They could keep the money. Then he asks Simon, which of those men do you think loved the money lender the most? Simon answered, well, the man who owed the most money would be the happiest. He would, he would love the lender most. And uh, the woman was like the man who owed $500. She had done many, many bad things, and she knew it. Uh, she had racked up a huge pile of sin debt. So she loved Jesus very much for forgiving her. Jesus said to Simon, Simon, you asked me to your house, but you didn't kiss my cheek. You didn't wash my feet, and you, you didn't give me any oil for my head. This woman has kissed my feet since I've been in here and washed them, and then she put oil on them. She showed her love for me. Simon didn't treat Jesus with a common courtesy that he would have treated the, even the least honored of his guests. Uh, yet this sinful woman went above and beyond to show Jesus her love. And then Jesus told the woman the best part of this story. I forgive you of all the sins you've done. Now you can go in peace. Now that's good news. He forgave her of her sins. This very sinful woman was forgiven. What a wonderful thing. 
This is a wonderful account of Christ's love, of the love he has for, for me, for you, for everyone. And it should fill you with joy that Jesus loves sinners. I know that I am. I was saved when I was 14. And then I fell away from the Lord and, and I made some poor choices. You know what, though? When I came to myself and I asked for forgiveness of what I'd done, guess what? He forgave me and he turned my life around. And he'll do the same for you. Jesus loves sinners. He loves bad sinners like the woman in our lesson. And he even loves good sinners, quote unquote, like the Pharisees. The woman was forgiven because she admitted the problem. She knew she was a sinner that needed forgiveness. Sometimes the problem with the Pharisee is their pride. They don't want to admit they're a sinner. Don't let your pride get in the way. We all deep down know that we're sinners. And we know that we have to be forgiven of that sin. And Jesus loves you. Never forget that. And he will forgive you of your sins. So, guys, I just want to encourage you uh, to continue reading your Bibles while you're home. Uh, those who want to kids, make sure that you continue doing your books. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing everybody. Uh, let's have a word of prayer uh, before, we, before we close Sunday school, okay? Heavenly Father, Lord, Lord, we love you, dear God. And Lord, I just ask you, Father, that those children at home and, and parents as well, Father, that... Uh, that the lesson blessed her heart, dear God, and I uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to give it, Lord. And Lord, I just ask you, if um, they don't know Jesus as Savior, Lord, may they ask him into their heart even now, Lord, and contact the church, Lord, um, contact any one of us, Lord, to, to let them know that they got saved, dear God. Lord, we love you and we thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning and welcome to Sunday School, Sunday, May the 3rd. Uh, we're glad you've tuned in this morning or you're listening, wherever you're at, wherever you're doing. We're glad you're with us. And take your Bibles, for please, and turn with me to the book of Exodus chapter number 4. Exodus chapter number 4, beginning in verse number 18. We'll read verses 18 through 26 and see what the Lord has for us from this passage of Scripture. Very important passage of Scripture. It could save your life. You say, what? Yes, this passage could literally save your life. So get your Bibles and look at it with me. We've been studying the life of Moses, beginning back in Exodus chapter 1, and uh, we've worked our way up to Exodus 4 this morning in verse number 18. And the Bible says, And Moses went and returned to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said unto him, Let me go, I pray thee, and return unto my brethren which are in Egypt, and see whether they be yet alive. And Jethro said to Moses, Go in peace. And the Lord said unto Moses in Midian, Go, return into Egypt, for all the men are dead which sought thy life. And Moses took his wife and his sons and set them upon an ass, and he returned to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the rod of God in his hand. And the Lord said unto Moses, When thou goest to return into Egypt, see that thou do all those wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in thy hand. But I will harden his heart, that he will not let the people go. And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. And I say unto thee, Let my son go, that he may serve me. And if thou refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. And it came to pass, by the way, in, in the end, that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. Then Zippor, his wife, took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at his feet and said, Surely a bloody husband art thou to me. Well, let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness and your love. Thank you for the Bible, truly your word you've given to our hands. Now as we open it together, as we look into it, we claim your promise, the promise of the Holy Spirit, that he would be our teacher and that he will lead us and guide us to all truth. So Holy Spirit, teach us, lead us, and guide us to the truth. Illuminate the Scriptures and speak to all of our hearts. Lord, I pray you'd take this message and do a great work. Pray for souls to be saved, Christians to be challenged, and certainly for Jesus to be exalted and glorified in, this, in, this few, in the few moments to come. This we ask for your glory and for your honor in Jesus' name. Amen. And Moses. <clears throat> I realize not a lot, a lot of you probably haven't been with us in our study of Moses. But when we think about Moses, uh, I was thinking about that, and I thought, you know, when we think about Moses, he's kind of like he's a superhero. 
Kind of like Superman or Spider-Man or Batman. He's like a superhero. And I can understand that because, you know, he takes the rod, he throws it down, turns into a serpent. He reaches and grabs it by the tail and turns it back into a rod. He takes, he turns the water, pours out water and it turns to blood. He calls for swarms of flies and there's flies everywhere. He calls for frogs and there's frogs, frogs and more frogs, frogs everywhere. He calls for locusts and there's locusts everywhere. He holds out his rod and, and the Red Sea divides and the people go across on dry land. I mean, water, he strikes the rock, and water comes from the rock. Manna in the wilderness and quail. And then he goes up on the mountain. When he comes down, his face glows, and that the people were afraid and couldn't look at him. Moses, superhero. But really, the truth is, Moses was flesh and blood like you and like me. Truth is, Moses was a sinful man like me and like you. The truth is, Moses is a man of like passions, just like you and I. And, uh, and he was a man who struggled spiritually, like many of us do. We struggle with our spiritual lives. Many of us do that. In Exodus 3 and 4, leading up to this uh, passage we're looking at, we've seen Moses, we've seen his rebellion, we've seen his reluctance to, to obey what God tells him to do. We've seen that God called him from the burning bush and said, I've come to deliver my people Israel out of bondage, and I've chosen you, Moses, <clears throat> to go and to lead them out of bondage into the, into the land of milk and honey. But what did Moses do? He offers excuses. Why, who am I? I'm a nobody. He said, well, well I don't know. What will I say? I don't know what to say. He said, well, well they won't believe me. He said, he said I can't talk, uh, talk real fluently, real eloquently. I, I just can't talk. And we saw that, and then finally in Exodus chapter 4, verse 13, he told the Lord, he said, just send anybody, but don't send me. In verse 14 of Exodus 4, God's anger <clears throat> was kindled against Moses. And that's not good. All right, that is not good. He, he, his, his persistence and his rebellion and resistance uh, kindled the anger of the Lord towards Moses. And so what happened in verse 15 and 16, God gave Moses Aaron to be his spokesman. Not God's perfect will. What's God's perfect will for Moses to go? For Moses to obey, to go, and to, and to speak to Pharaoh, and to lead the people. But he's resisting and he's rebellion against God's revealed will for his life. And so, so, so then we pick up in verse 18. In verse 18, now Moses is going. Verse 18 says, And Moses went and returned to Jethro, his father-in-law. So Moses was at that mount, was in the backside of the desert, and he's at Mount Horeb. And so now he finally he takes the sheep, the sheep of Jethro, and he goes back to his father-in-law. He goes back from the backside of the desert, back to Midian, to his father-in-law and his wife and his children. All right. So to his father-in-law, to whom he is employed, because he's watching Jethro's sheep. So verse 18 says, and Moses went. He returned to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said unto him, Now notice what he says to him. He says, Let me go, I pray thee, and return unto my brethren, which are in Egypt, and see whether they yet be alive. See if they're still yet alive. All right? So he says, I want to go and see if they are still yet alive. Now Moses is asking permission. He's asking, well basically he's asking for a leave of absence from his father-in-law, for whom he is employed. He says, right, I need a leave of absence here. I want to go back and check on my people, people of Israel. Now remember, it's been 40 years. Moses has been with Jethro for 40 years. So it's 40 years since he fled Egypt. And now God is calling him and sending him back. And so he goes and he says, let me go and see if they're even yet alive. Now when you read this verse, I notice what I notice is there is no mention in this verse of the burning bush. There's no mention of God sending him back to Egypt. He says, may I, may I go and see whether they're yet alive? He doesn't say, God appeared to me in the burning bush, and God has chosen me, and God has ordained me, and God has directed me, and I'm going to go back and to lead them out. Now, no, no mention of God's call, no mention of the rod that turns to a serpent and then turns back to a rod. There's no mention of putting his hand in his bosom and then calling it out in his leprosy and putting it back and pulling it out in its hole. There's no mention of any of this. And so the flavor of this Oh, when you look at this and you start trying to picture it and put yourself in that position, the flavor of this is, is, a, is, a, is a reluctant servant 
or who has offered excuses and rebellion. And now he's going back and he says, I, I need to go down and check on my people Israel. And so Jethro in verse 18 says, go in peace. So Jethro gives him, bids him Godspeed to go and to check on them. Now verse 19, now look at verse 19. Verse 19, and the Lord said unto Moses, what did he say to him? He said to him, now notice, said unto Moses in Midian, verse 19 specifically points out Moses is now in Midian. He's no longer in the backside of the desert. He's no longer at Mount Hor, or Mount Sinai, it's also called. He is now back in Midian. So verse 19 says, And the Lord said unto Moses in Midian, All right, what did he say to him? He said, Go. God, tell, God is telling Moses again to go. Now, why do I say again? Because this is the third time. This is the third time that God has told Moses to go. He told him in chapter 3, verse 16, he said, go. He told him in chapter 4, verse 12, he said, Moses, go. And now in chapter 4 here, in this verse before us, he is telling him, go. He says, go, 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 Moses, go. Go, return into Egypt. So, so, so he says, for all the men which sought thy life, they're dead. So now he's telling him to go. This certainly is not the picture of a superhero. And this is certainly not the picture of a, of, a, of, a, of a good role model. This is a picture of a reluctant servant who's not wanting to go down into Egypt. So verse number 20 says, Moses took his wife, okay, takes his wife, and then he takes his sons, Paul, and then he set them upon an ass, and he returned to the land of Egypt, and Moses took the rod of God in his hand. So in verse number 20, Moses takes his wife and his children, and he sets them upon the donkey, and now they're going to make the trip from Midian down to Egypt. That is a trip, I've looked at it on a map, and from Midian to Egypt is about 400 miles. 400 miles. Certainly not a two-hour trip, certainly not even a one-day trip. I mean, he puts his wife and children on a donkey, and now how fast, how fast would it take you to travel 400 miles on a donkey? It's going to take a little while. And so Moses begins this long journey through the desert with his wife and his children on a, on a donkey here, and they're going back to Egypt. So we see in verse 20, Moses took his wife and his children, and he begins this journey back unto Egypt. Now, God gives in verses 21 through 23, God gives Moses instructions, further instructions, on what he's to tell Pharaoh. And not, well, next week, Lord willing, I want to look at verses 21 through 23. But today I want us to jump down to verse number 24. Verse number 24 says, And it came to pass. And it came to pass. In other words, the Bible says to us, Now here's what, here's what happens. This is, this is what occurred as Moses is making this long 400 mile trip from Midian back to Egypt. Here is what happened. Now it came to pass. This happened. And God put it in His Word. So that tells us that this is important. This is important. Because what we're going to see here, we're going to see Moses neglect. We're going to, in addition to his stubborn rebellion and flat out saying, God send anybody but me, now we're going to see Moses' neglect. What we're going to see here as we look in this verse, we see a man who's doing what God told him to do, to go. So he saddled up his wife and his kids, and he's, and, he's, and he's actually traveling and making the trip to Egypt. So bodily, he is doing what God wanted him to do, what God was telling him to do. But well, when you look into this verse, and you, and you start digging deep into the verse, you see that although he was obeying bodily, he was not obeying with all of his heart. He was not wholehearted obedience. It was just outward obedience, like a little boy. His mommy tells him to take out the trash. Well, he doesn't want to do it, but he does it. So he's obeying bodily, but he's not obeying with all of his heart. He's like the teenager who does what mom and dad says, and they're doing it physically. They're doing what they said, but they're not obeying from the heart. And when I look at this verse, and we, as we'll dig into this verse, we see Moses doing what God has asked him to do, but we do not see him doing it heartily as he should be doing. So the verse says, verse 24 says, And it came to pass, here is what happens on this journey, 400 mile journey back to Egypt. And it came to pass by the way. 
That means along the way, along the road, along the journey. Along the just tells how far he'd went, just that they had started and they're traveling. And as, they, and as they were going along this journey, it says, by the way, in the end. That means a lodging place. So they came to a place where they were going to lodge, and they, they came to a lodging place. And something very amazing happens at this lodging place. And this verse says, at the end, the Lord met him. The Lord met him. So Moses is obeying. He's traveling towards Egypt. And as he goes along his journey, he comes to a lodging place. And him and his family are lodging here. And as he was lodging here, the Bible tells us that the Lord, notice it says the Lord. That means Jehovah, Lord God, the self-existent, the eternal God. The Lord. Lord means boss and master. And so what happened is the, the Lord, the boss, the maker, the creator, the boss, the master, he, he is the king of kings, the Lord of lords. Hey, the Lord, Jehovah, ever self-existent, eternal God, appeared, uh, met Moses on this journey here. He is the master of Moses. He is the maker of Moses. And so as he traveled along this road, the Lord met him. It says in verse 24, the Lord met him. He met Moses. Now the same Lord of Moses is Lord of you and is Lord of me. The Bible says in the book of Acts that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. And that is a true statement. Whether you're a Christian or not a Christian, He is still Lord. He's your boss and your master. He created you. He made you. He made you for His pleasure. He made you to serve Him and honor Him. He is your master. You say, I don't have a master. Oh, yeah, you do. You have a master, and that master is God. And Moses met his master. He met his Lord, which is God Almighty. And the Lord met Moses. Now, this is a serious verse. In verse number 24, And the Lord met him, and the Bible says then, and sought to kill him. The Lord, the boss and master of Moses, met him, and it says he sought, he was seeking, he was striving to kill him. In other words, to take his life. Separate his spirit from his body, the body back to dust, and the body then goes to God and gave it. So Moses is making this journey, and the Lord met him, and the Lord sought to kill Moses. And I went, Wow. Let that just uh, stop right there and think about that for a moment. God has called Moses. He's commissioned Moses. He's sending Moses. And yet God met him along the way. And he's seeking to kill him and to take his life. So that begs the question, why? And then when we, and this is a question, this is a verse that we should all, me, you, and all of us, we should look at this verse and we should ask that question. And we should seek to understand why God was seeking to kill Moses. Why did God come in? He's obeying, is He not? Is He going to Egypt? Yes, He is. But yet God came and God met Him on the journey and God sought to kill Him to take His life. We should, we should ask why. We should seek to understand why. And we should take heed and take warning and learn a Bible lesson from it. In the book of Hebrews, in the book of Hebrews chapter 2, uh, if you'll hold your place there, and let's look at Hebrews chapter 2 for just a moment. And there's some words there that we will put beside this. In Hebrews chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, it says, Therefore we ought, this is what we should do, Hebrews 2 verse 1, we ought to give the more earnest, genuine, earnest, and sincere with energy and zeal, earnest heed to the things which we have heard, and then he tells us why, lest at any time we should let them slip or slide away or fall away. And he said in verse 2, For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression of disobedience received a just recompense of reward. How, and then he asks a question here, very important question, Hebrews 2 verse 3, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Neglect, that's an ugly word. What's it mean? It means heedless, careless, inattention, and omission of duty. And so Hebrews 3, 2 verse 3 says, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? How, and we could read that verse, How shall I escape if I neglect so great salvation? We could read that verse, and you can read it and say, How shall you escape if you neglect 
so great a salvation. If you if you are heedless and careless and inattentive, and you just an omission to it, you just pay no attention, and you let it slip, as he said in Hebrews two verse one. So now we're, all we're looking at here is Moses in, in Exodus four verse four, four verse twenty four, and it came to pass that by the way along the journey at the at in the end at the at the at the place where he was uh, going to spend the night at the end that the Lord met him. The Lord, the boss, the master met him, and then the Lord sought to kill him. He sought to kill him. Why? Because of his neglect. You see, he, Moses, Moses' neglect of spiritual things. I mean, seemingly he's obeying, but it's not wholehearted obedience. And no, Moses has been neglectful of spiritual things in his life. And that's evident when you read verse 25. Verse 25 says... Then, when the, then at this point, when the Lord met him to kill him, the Bible says in verse 25, Then Zipporah, which is his wife, took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at his feet and said, Surely a bloody husband art thou to me. So what, what happened is well, Moses has been neglecting circumcision. He has not circumcised his son as the law was to tell him and orders him and commands him to do. Let's look at it in Genesis chapter number 17. Genesis 17. And we'll see what this is and why it's so important. In Genesis 17, verse 7, the Bible says, And I will establish my covenant between me and thee. God is speaking to Abraham here in this passage. And he said, I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee. It's not just Abraham. It's his descendants of whom is Moses. Moses is a descendant of Abraham. And so this verse is talking to Abraham and to all of his seed, including Moses. And so the verse says, I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. That's the journey God sent Moses on, is to fulfill this promise, to bring them to that land that God has promised to the nation of Israel. And verse 9 says, And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant. Notice the wording. Thou shalt keep my covenant. Therefore, Thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. Thou shalt keep my covenant. And God said unto Abraham in verse number 10, And this is my covenant, which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. And ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token. It will be a token. It will be a seal. It will be an emblem of the covenant between me and you. And the covenant that God made with Abraham and with his children was that God would be their God and they would be his people. God would separate them out and sanctify and cleanse them and they would become his people and that he would be their God and that they would serve him and he, and he, he will be their God. And as a sign and emblem of that covenant, that sacred covenant that God has made with Abraham and his seed was a, was a seal, was circumcision, a token of that tremendous covenant and that relationship that was to exist between God and His people. So in verse, back in Exodus chapter 4, verses 24 and 25, God meets Abraham and He's seeking to kill him. And it's evident that the reason why, because verse 25 says, then Sephora took a stone and cut off the foreskin of her son, she circumcised him. And verse 26 says, So he, God, let him, Moses, go. Zipporah saved the life of Moses. Zipporah saved his life that day. See, Moses had neglected. He had neglected. He had been heedless and careless and inattentive, an omission to his duty. And you can offer up 10,000 excuses, but the bottom line is, listen carefully, Moses was negligent concerning his spiritual duty and his spiritual life. And God met him, and God's going to kill him. See, God is sending him to be the leader of the nation of Israel. He's sending him to lead him out. 
And before Moses can do that, then Moses has got to get some things right in his heart and in his life. And so that's what's happening in this verse. And so God is speaking to me and God is speaking to you. See, God has made a covenant with us. We have a new covenant through the blood of Jesus Christ. And if we're going to serve Him, and God, just like He gave the Jews circumcision, He gives us baptism. Baptism is an outward admission of an inward work. Of how the, you've been saved by grace and made a new creation, buried and raised new to life. Wait, hey, listen, if you, haven't, if you need to get, number one, you need to get saved. Number two, you need to get baptized. And number three, you need to serve God with all your heart. That was what was missing in Moses' life. I mean, he wasn't serving him with all of his heart, and he was being neglectful towards his spiritual duty. And there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people around this world, and they, and they, and they, and they claim to know Jesus, and they claim to be following Him. And yeah, they may be like Moses. They may be walking on their journey down to Egypt. They may be doing what God said to do, but they're just like a little boy taking out the trash. They're doing it bodily, but it's not from a heart that's fully surrendered to God, and God knows it. And could it be that God may meet you? that God may meet me. Could it be God won't meet me or you today? See, God is God. Could He have killed Moses that day? He certainly could have. God is God. He, may, he can take my life today. He can take your life today. Right now. I may, I, I may not walk out of this building. He's God. He gives life and He takes life. And here is a servant that is negligent to his spiritual duty, and he's disobedient, rebellion, and half-hearted in his service to God. And God just said, okay, that's it. And God met him on the way, and God sought to kill him. But thank God for his wife, Zipporah. She had enough spiritual insight to understand what was going on, and she took a sharp stone, and she circumcised her son. And God, and what verse 26 says, then the Lord, verse 26 says, and so he, God, let him, Moses, go. So God stood back and He let him go. This is a critical point in the life and the ministry of Moses. This point right here. Today, you know, people persist in their rebellion and their neglect of their spiritual duty. And I could stop right there and go on about fathers and mothers, even preachers and teachers. and I mean, it's just kids, teenagers. Our spiritual duty is right here. It's right here. Are we negligent of it? Are we letting the things slip which we've heard and which we know? Understand if you are negligent in your spiritual duty that God could meet you just like He did Moses and take you out of this world. That's what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. They were, they were being negligent concerning their spiritual duty and they were eating and drinking unworthy of the Lord's Supper, the communion. And the Bible says they were eating and drinking damnation to themselves not discerning the Lord's body. And it says in 1 Corinthians 11, For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep for that very reason. See, God had met them. Those people in 1 Corinthians 11, God met them along the journey, and He took their lives. That's why it says they sleep. That means they're dead. God took them out of this world. He is God. He is King of kings. He is Lord. And you're and listen, Moses was just about that close, right there, if you can even see that. He was that close to saying goodbye to this world. And his wife Zipporah stood in the gap for him and circumcised her son. Now and then she threw it down at his feet and she called him a bloody husband. Bloody husband, one who causes death and heartache. And I, I, I'm just, I mean, I'm not going to say I'm not right there. I'm just going to let the Holy Spirit say it to you. Are you a husband? Are you a wife? Are you a teenager that causes heartache, sorrow, and death? Then could be that God might just meet you along the journey today, tomorrow, next week. He's God. He's God. It's at His discretion. I think of what it says in the book of Revelation, chapter number 3. In the book of Revelation, chapter number 3, if I may read to you what it says. Revelation 3, if you want to turn to it in your Bibles. The book of Revelation, chapter 3, beginning... In verse number 15, to the church of Laodiceans, he said, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou were cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm 
neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. For as many as I love, I rebuke. God loved Moses, and he rebuked him there on that journey. He says, Many as I love, I rebuke, and I chasten them. Yeah, God chastened Moses. He said, be zealous, therefore, and what? Repent. Repent. What is God calling? What was God calling Moses to do? To repent and to serve Him with a whole heart, wholeheartedly. And what is God calling you and I to do today? To repent of our neglect and our rebellion and to serve Him with all of our heart. And He said in verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6 is a great passage. Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6, here's what it says. It says, Trust in the Lord with all thy heart, and lean not in thy own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. What a beautiful way to live. To trust in the Lord with all of your heart, and lean not into your own understanding, but just let Him direct your paths. That was the point that Moses needed to come to in his life. He needed to come to that point where he would trust in the Lord with all of his heart and lean not into his own understanding, but simply go and obey and follow the Word and the light that God had given him. What a beautiful way to live. <clears throat> Are you living that way? Are you living? What a, oh, oh, you know, that's what I want to do. I want to live that way. How about you? I mean, number one, what you need to do today, if you're not saved, you need to take Jesus as Lord of your life. That's a beautiful way to live. As saved, redeemed, heaven bound. That's a beautiful way to live. I, I recommend Jesus to you today. How do you say, how can I do that? Bow your head and pray a simple prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, forgive me my sin. Come into my heart and be Lord of my life. The best I know how, I now trust Jesus as my Savior. If you'll bow your head and pray those words from your heart, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. God will save and redeem you, and your name will be written down in glory, and the angels will be rejoicing. Then after you've done that, here's what God wants us to do every day. Die to self. The Apostle Paul said, I die daily. He said, we need to die daily and walk in the light of His Word and the gifts He gives. Exodus chapter 4, Moses is obeying outwardly, but he has an inward problem and God met him along the way, and God sought to kill him. And his wife stepped in, and the Lord spared his life that day. I'm glad for a praying mama, a praying grandma, praying for a tread for a praying church, because many there's disobedience and rebellion in all of us. It's in me, it's in you, it's in all of us. But aren't you glad for the grace of God, the mercy of God that lets us go another day? It gives us another chance. And God's given you another chance today. So I counsel you, like the Bible said in Revelation here, He said, I counsel thee to repent. Today can be a new beginning, a new start for you. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you for all of your goodness and your love. Thank you for the time we had in your word. Pray for that soul that's nearest hell, that they would trust Jesus right now and be redeemed. But I pray for Christians. Lord, help us to serve you with all of our hearts and not give you half-hearted service. Father, help us to be alert and give heed to the things we've heard, not be ne negligent to our spiritual duty. Father, from this day and forth, we repent, ask your mercy and your forgiveness, and we ask your leading and guiding. Help us, Father, to serve you and obey you faithfully. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you and have a wonderful week. In Jesus' name.
right, good evening. Good to have you join us this evening here at Ripley Tabernacle Baptist Church. And I trust this morning's preaching from the porch was a blessing to you, and we're so thankful for that opportunity. And then also our Sunday school hour we just had at 5 o'clock. Uh, we're thankful for having that. And we're going to do this Sunday school at 5 o'clock for a period of time now. We'll let you know when that changes, and that'll, that'll work well for what we're doing in the morning service and, and, and things as they change there. So keep in mind, I pray that you'll uh, pray for our services and be involved where you can. I really appreciate all the, the cards and the text and the phone calls, as I've mentioned several times. I was reading, you know, I've got several letters even right here. I was reading several this morning, and just what a blessing that folks are tuned in and, and supporting and praying for their church. I just want to say thank you. I, I really appreciate that. Uh, at this time, uh, Pastor Josh is going to come and mention some youth announcements, you know, some changes as we go through this journey that we're on, and also lead our service in a word of prayer. God bless you. All right, good evening, Ripley Tabernacle Baptist Church. I just want to give you guys a few announcements regarding some of our youth stuff uh, coming up and, and looking into the summer a little bit. Uh, first off, I do want to thank all of our teenagers who have uh, been tuning into our Zoom live meetings on Thursday nights. We will still continue doing those for the foreseeable future. So parents, if, if your child has not been tuning in, I promise uh, Zoom has gotten a lot of their security things figured out. So it's, it's a fine platform to use. We've been having a good time. It's just a good time uh, to see each other, share some prayer requests and things like that. So that's Thursday nights at 7 o'clock. I always send out the meeting ID and password on our Remind app. If you do not have Remind, sign up for that or just text me. Call me, email me, whatever you can do, and we will get you set up Thursday night, 7 o'clock. Uh, it's, it's a good time. Also, um, if you did not get a glow-in-the-dark this morning at our drive-in service, uh, let me know, and we will bring one to you, our little devotional books that our kids, junior kids, and teenagers use. Uh, we want you to have those so you can keep doing your devotions. Um, so if you did not get one this morning, let me know. We'll get you one. And then my last announcement, this is probably the most important, um, regarding camps for our summer time um, because of the situation and because especially for our teen camp going out of state we've decided that it is not in the best interest for our teenagers and for our church uh, to do that as an organized group uh, so we will not be going to camp joy this summer uh, now we are going to look at it's hard to plan to extend it in the future but we are going to look at still doing some awesome things this summer with our teenagers and with our kids uh, we'll do some big days some fun events some fun activities and and, and try to get you know uh, the most spiritual impact we can to to match camp uh, but just uh, because of safety concerns we will not be going to teen camp at camp joy and then also regarding junior camp uh, i I believe I was given some information as of right now. They're not planning on having camp either. So we're going to figure out some things for our junior kids as well. But just want to get those announcements out there so that way we can uh, better uh, start to think ahead. If you have any ideas of things that we can do that would be safe, that would be productive, that would be spiritually impactful for our teenagers, for our juniors, let me know. Okay, I'm always open for ideas. This is a different, weird time we are living in and we're all trying to do the best we can. And it's a little bit of uh, outside the box thinking. So I need your help. All right. So if you have any ideas, have any helps, please let me know. All right. Hope you all enjoy the rest of the service. Let us uh, open our service in prayer. Dear Lord, I thank you for this day. Lord, thank you for the drive-in service and the preaching from the porch we had this morning. Thank you that we can still come together even in a different type of way. But Lord, thank you for uh, the memorial that it will set up and the thing that we'll be able to look back to and say how good you were even in, in troublesome times. Lord, I pray that you will bless the rest of this evening. I ask that um, distractions at the, at the house would be... Uh, put away that we would not be thinking about other things but Lord let us focus solely on what you would have for us tonight through the preaching and through the praise and, and through all that would be done Lord thank you for the faithfulness of your people thank you for the encouragement that they are Lord we love you and pray that you would just be blessed lifted up honored and glorified in Jesus name I pray amen
David sang the praises of the glory of Jehovah. Paul preached that all is lost, save knowing Christ. Little John said he is precious by leaning on his bosom so for a moment may I humbly testify did I mention that I love him how I worship and adore Get your Bibles out. Nehemiah chapter 1. Nehemiah chapter 1. Thank the Lord for the uh, special music. I always enjoy that. And what an encouragement. Just seems like it prepares my heart. So I appreciate those involved in special music. Nehemiah chapter 1. And um, as I think about Nehemiah, we, we, we did a study on Nehemiah last year in our Wednesday evening Bible study. And I really enjoyed that. And it seemed like as I was studying this past week, this passage kept coming to me. So I thought, well, I'll revisit that and uh, begin looking at it. And 
as I think about the day and age we're living in and, and what's going on and how things have changed for each and every one of us, um, I was reminded of this passage. And as I think about it, Nehemiah, in a lot of ways, had it made. He was the king's cupbearer and uh, in, a, in a position that afforded him a, a home in the palace there and a closeness to the king and a kind of a life of luxury, you might say, uh, compared to most of his Jewish counterparts. And I think about um, the, the frowning providence. I mean, God had driven the, um, the, uh, the people from their homeland in Jerusalem. And, and then, but God had uh, like smiled on Nehemiah, you might say, uh, who had grown up in the Babylonian capital and had enjoyed the privileges of being among the king's court. Nevertheless, when we read this passage of Scripture here in just a moment, Nehemiah, Nehemiah makes it clear that the comforts of Babylon were not enough to overrule his concern for the things of God and his people. And Nehemiah was a man who uh, became consumed with a burden. In his example, we're reminded that whenever, whenever God uses a person to accomplish his work, it all begins with a burden. And I want to look at the thought that this evening, it all begins with a burden. And that'll be the title of the message. And, you know, uh, I read, you never lighten the load unless you first have felt a pressure in your own soul. You never use of God to bring blessings until God has opened your eyes and made you see things as they are. Nehemiah was called to build the wall, but first he had to weep over the ruins. Did you get that? First he had to weep over the ruins. Today, we usually talk of burdens as something we want to lay down, something we want to get rid of uh, as quickly as possible. Yet God uses burdens of a certain kind to motivate His people into action. So I'm concerned that we hear too much about the burdens we want rid of that we don't sometimes grasp have any burden for somebody or for something. It's not fame or fortune, greed or glory, you might say, that compels a missionary to leave everything for a foreign land. That's not it. It's a burden. The real work of God is not accomplished by those at ease in Zion. It's accomplished by those who are pushed to their knees about Zion. So let's look at this passage, Nehemiah chapter 1. We're going to read the first four verses, okay? First four verses, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hechelai. And it came to pass in the month of Chislu, in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan, the palace, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the providence are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven." We'll look at those four verses here for just a little bit with the thought it all begins with a burden. Let's go to the Lord in prayer first. Lord, we love you. Thank you so much. Lord, what, what, a, what a day you've given us and uh, what a privilege we have this evening to open up your word and, and preach. God, I pray this passage would help open our eyes and help us to visualize what's, what's around us and the needs that are there and Lord, that it would so much so that it would become a burden. I pray that as we look at the life of Nehemiah here, that you would help me to say what's needed. Lord, encourage us and help. And uh, Lord, we've been blessed. So many good things. Help us not to be overshadowed by the needs that are there, that we don't, we don't see those. And I pray you'd help us. Thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right. Well, I think about all, it all begins with a burden. As, uh, as we see Nehemiah stirred in these opening verses by what he heard, not what he saw, by what he heard, 
we're reminded of uh, some factors, I believe, involved in, in the life of a burdened person. The first thing I notice is where a burdened person starts. Now think about that for a minute. In verse 1, Nehemiah says, And it came to pass in the month of Chislu, in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan, the palace. Um, as we've noted, this was not a bad place to be. He was in, in royalty, among royalty and, and comfort. And yet in spite of the luxury of all the surroundings that Nehemiah had, in spite of that comfort, in spite of all that he enjoyed there in the palace, you see what it says in verse 4? I sat down and wept and mourned certain days. He was in an area of comfort, much like we are often. He was in an area where things were good and things were provided for. Yet he sat down and wept and mourned certain days. What is it that led Nehemiah to his brokenness? Where did Nehemiah become a burdened person? In, we fi in this passage, we find that there were some factors that led to Nehemiah's burden. He reminds us that a burdened person doesn't reach that condition accidentally or unpredictably. Where does a burdened person start? First of all, I want to note this. It starts with a concern. Think about that. It starts with a concern. It's at least likely that Nehemiah, in studying and reading, had not seen the city of Jerusalem. Think about that. The exile was 70 years long, and Nehemiah was living a number of years uh, after that first remnant had returned to the city, marking the end of the exile. And all Nehemiah knew about Jerusalem was related to him through his relatives and his friends. And in spite of his apparent disconnect physically, uh, you might say, from the city of his fathers, we find Nehemiah had a concern for that place. And when I was reading this, I, I began to think about a missionary going to a foreign land. I mean, God puts a burden on their heart for a people they don't know, and often for a place they've never seen. And that seems to be the case here. In verse 2 it says, The hand and I, one of my brethren came, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity. And concerning Jerusalem, Nehemiah was concerned uh, 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 for the condition of the people and the city itself. He was, his burden, you might say, was birthed from that concern. Nehemiah had got a concern for those people. Ours could be described, you might say, as an age of apathy. Sadly, it's rare that anyone is truly concerned with anything beyond themselves and their own lives. And I say that with all respect because I know that's not true for everybody. But overall, we sense that. And uh, I've used the illustration, you know, how often we, we ask somebody how you're doing, supposedly in an element of concern. Well, then someone begins to tell us how they're doing, and all of a sudden we weren't concerned. We really didn't want to hear all that. It was a general cliche, a general speech. And help us not to be that way. Help us to be concerned truly with how uh, people are doing. So we notice the concern. Something else we notice is a call. Now it's not plainly stated in this passage of Scripture, but the book reveals, I believe, what was going on in the heart of Nehemiah that gave him this concern. And he, it, was, it was a call of God on his life. Now in Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse 12. Turn there real quick, just probably a page or so over, and look what it says in Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse 12. It says, what my God has put in my heart to do. There was a call on Nehemiah's life to accomplish something. It wasn't just emotion. It wasn't just patriotism for that place or some kind of religious zeal that was stirred. No. He was being called by God. Now the opening chapter records no audible call. It, it doesn't share that. But I like what one old preacher said. It was clearly louder than that. He could hardly have sustained his work had it not been sustained, uh, had he not been sustained himself by a strong sense that God sent him and was standing by him as he initiated it. 
So in Nehemiah, we see this concern and we sense this call we mentioned there in chapter 2, verse 12, but also with a capability. Now, whether you see that, um, God placed Nehemiah in the palace for the work he was going to do or that God called Nehemiah because of where he was in relation to the king. Either way, either situation, there's no denying that Nehemiah's position as cupbearer made him uniquely qualified to initiate the work that God had put on his heart. God had placed him in a situation where he could accomplish exactly what God wanted him to do. Isn't that something? Sometimes God places his places and we may not like it or even understand it, but God's got a plan and God's got to work. It reminds me of uh, where God guides, God provides. God burdened Nehemiah's heart because he had the opportunity and the capability of doing the very thing that God had called him to do. Some people claim to be burdened and even called for a particular ministry. But they're in no position to fulfill that whatsoever. It may be that God has not actually called them. You know, if a burden or a call from God are genuine, a genuine somehow and somewhere the capability or the opportunity to fulfill that will become a reality. The capability to do something uh, about a burden, I believe, will often reveal the difference between merely being stirred. You know, a lot of folks, boy, they get emotional and get stirred about something. I mean, every time a missionary comes, they want to go to the field. Every time somebody preaches about this, uh, boy, they want to go to do that. They typically don't, but they get stirred. Not a true burden. A burden person starts with a concern, a call, and a capability to respond to both of those. So we notice here not only um, where a burden person starts, but let's look at what a burden person sees. Look at verse 3. Notice um, the report that Nehemiah's brother and his companions gave to him. And they said unto me that the remnant that are left of the captivity there in the providence are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. This apparently affected Nehemiah to a greater degree than those that shared it with him, those that gave him that information. While I'm sure that none of the Jews liked the way that things were in Jerusalem and none of them liked the condition and, and, and the things that were surrounding there, but we only read of one who was so truly moved by that, and that was Nehemiah. That was Nehemiah. As I look further here, uh, um, Nehemiah's burden was connected to what he saw there of the, the situation of the, of the Jewish remnant in their city. Um, so let, let's think about what he saw, the reality of it. Now, this is more than just a bad report. It's more than just uh, sad news. Nehemiah, in this report, think about what he heard. He heard the words, great affliction and reproach. What if someone came and told you that your family or your loved ones were in great affliction and reproach? Also, you see the words broken down. They were broken down. And then you heard the words burned concerning the city gates. And immediately Nehemiah sees the reality of the situation. He heard the news and saw the reality of it. Now, there's no effort for Nehemiah to put his own thoughts into that necessarily. He doesn't say, I hate to hear that. Well, that's terrible. At least the temple's rebuilt. You didn't hear that. Well, he wasn't trying to sugarcoat it and say, well, at least they have this and that and such. Nehemiah didn't do that in this passage. He doesn't minimize the situation. He sees the reality of it and is burdened by that reality. You know, uh, we never have holy burden 
until we have an honest view on how bad it really is. Think about that. Um, I believe often that affects our ministry and our outreach because we don't see the burden of the condition that people are actually in. You know, there are some that are always looking for the bright side, and that's wonderful. I, I like to be positive and have a great outlook, and, and, and that's good. But let's not be blinded by our own optimism and, and, and miss the reality or the fact that there are great needs. And there are people that are struggling and hurting. There are many situations in which the, the good news cannot be seen until the bad news has been completely and honestly comprehended. I'm thankful that I'm saved. I'm so thankful that I have a home in heaven. And it'd be great to dwell on that thought. Isn't that wonderful? That's, that's, that's good news. That's a blessing for a child of God to know they've got a place one day that they'll spend all eternity with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we could just gather that thought and live on that every day. The problem with that is there's a lost and dying world out there that need to know about Jesus Christ. And we need a burden for that. Oh yeah, I'm glad I know where I'm going. I'm glad I got that settled. And I hope you do. Not everybody does. We need to get the gospel out and let them know. A burdened person will clearly see the reality. They'll also see the ramifications. Now, when I think about Nehemiah's burden and what he shares here, his concern is really not primarily for this beautiful historic city or even the status of the nation. Nehemiah... Now, I want you to get this. Nehemiah's concern is with that broken down city, what that means to the glory of God. That's his concern. What that means to the glory of God. It's an aspect we seldom see. We don't see how it affects God. We, we miss that often, how it affects Him. We get caught up in the fleshly responses of, of how that it affects us and the things that we can touch and see that we often miss. I mean, don't you realize that that lost person out there, that breaks God's heart? He's not willing that any would perish. When there's devastation and disaster and, and, and the people of God are hurting, that breaks God's heart. We miss that often because we, our flesh has its own crying out and its own hurts and it's, it's affected by how we, you know, we, we feel about the situation. Nehemiah had asked anxiously about the state of things in Jerusalem because he cared so much about the glory of God and the good souls that were there. His, his interest uh, was, uh, was, was for them and the God's glory, Him being magnified in the situation. It's one thing to be concerned for a city and the inhabitants that were there and those that were in distress. But when that city and those people are gods, think about that, the burden suddenly takes on a new perspective. Things begin to change. A special burden is weighted with more than just social or personal concerns. A spiritual burden bears the weight of concerns for the glory of God and His work. For the glory of God and His work. The burdened person sees not just broken down walls and struggling people, but he sees the larger spiritual issues concerned. I read this thought, more than broken walls, the cause of Nehemiah's grief was bound up with the honor of the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The glory of Israel and of Israel's God was at stake. See, a burdened person will see the reality, see the ramifications. they also see the responsibility. <laughs> this word begins to change. They see the responsibility. Nehemiah, I mean, he's like 800 miles away. That's a long ways. I have a daughter and a son-in-law in Pensacola, Florida. It's about 850 miles away. 
That's a long ways. But, and he's actually not seen the city, but he feels a connection to it. And beyond that, he feels a responsibility, a responsibility for it. He's moved and burdened personally. It's so easy often to detach ourselves from the larger work of God and amidst the personal responsibility that rests upon us to participate in what God's doing. Nehemiah's burden comes from being able to see his responsibility to God and his work. He's so stirred because he realizes his connection to the need. It's as if Nehemiah is already sitting in the rubble, can smell the charred, burnt gates. It's, almost, it's like he's already in that place. His mind and heart and soul is already there experiencing what he's hearing about while he's in the comforts of the palace. It's like he's not even thinking about that. Oh, his, he's been moved. He's been burdened about the Lord and the hurt and the concern related to that. You know, um, it never dawns on some of us to take personal responsibility. Those with a, with a burden see not only the problem, but their responsibility in the solution. So let me just say it like this, okay? There's a lot of folks that aren't saved, What's your responsibility? What's my responsibility? We have great responsibility to get the gospel around the world. In these opening verses, we learn from Nehemiah not only where a burdened person starts, and we looked at what a burdened person sees, but I think real important who a burdened person seeks. Once a burden has firmly settled on somebody, and I've noticed this with missionaries as they begin their deputation, as they begin their journey to try to get to a foreign land thousands of miles away. Once that burden's settled upon a person, what do they do then? Where, where do they take that burden? To whom do they turn? Nehemiah points us to the answer here in verse 4. Look what it says. When I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. And he reminds us here that we are, when we are moved by a burden, when we're moved by that, when we're moved by what we hear and, and what we see, before we act upon it, we must seek God about His will and what He intends for us to do about that which He has laid upon our heart. We learn in this particular passage, especially in verse 4, that a burdened person seeks the heart of God. Seeks the heart of God. In verse 4, Nehemiah mourns for several days. <laughs> in the comforts of his living room, in the comforts of his home, in the, in the comforts of his castle, you might say, with all the fine things and luxury in his comfort zone, he hears about this and mourns for several days, broken hearted concerning God's people and God's glory. Then he adds to that, I mean, we think about mourning for several days over these people in God's glory, then it says he fasted. So in the act of mourning and the discipline of fasting, what we see is Nehemiah trying to grow closer to the heart of God. You can sense it. What's it mean to fast? It means to miss a meal for one purpose and one purpose only and that's zeroing in with your your walk with God. We 
In fasting, we personally, I mean, we purposely set aside our physical needs and wants in an effort to draw closer to God, to demonstrate to Him our desire for Him. We're denying self. We're, we're denying flesh for a period of time to focus on God. Nehemiah is truly burdened, and he's willing to seek the Lord even at the expense of his own comfort. He reminds us about seeking the heart of God, but he also mentions the hearing, the hearing of God. In verse 4, Nehemiah says that he fasted and he likewise prayed. He prayed. Fasting is not an individual exercise. It's a little more than a diet, if you think about it, if it's not accompanied by prayer. It's obvious that Nehemiah was a man of prayer. As you study out the book and these chapters, I mean, he was a man of prayer. He's constantly turning to God, seeking uh, a hearing with the one who knew the success of the work. Well, we'd be wise to do that too, wouldn't we? In any area that God's given us to minister, be wise to seek His face. The weight of a burden should push us to our knees before it propels us into action. If we've fully seen the need, then we'll likewise seek the answer on our knees in prayer. John Bunyan said, you can do more than pray after you've prayed, but you cannot do more than pray until you have prayed. Wow. Someone else said it like this. Prayer does not prepare us for a greater work. Prayer is the greater work. I like that. Prayer doesn't prepare us for a greater work. Prayer is the greater work. Those that will have a, who have a burden will seek the heart of God and they'll seek the hearing of God. But notice something else. They'll seek the help of God. Before Nehemiah turns to the king, the king of Persia, he turns to the God who rules above all earthly powers. His conscience that, that he'll need help from the king, I'm sure that's already in his mind. He, he knows that he'll need to ask, and we read further in the chapter that the king would allow him to, to do this that God's placed upon his, part, his heart. But w before he does that, he seeks God. He realizes the help of the king is worthless without the help of God. <laughs> The help of the king is worthless without the help of God. Those of the burden recognize that apart from the grace of God, nothing can be accomplished. Nothing can be accomplished. It, 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 if he doesn't help us do that which he's laid upon our hearts, our burdens have no hope of being lifted and our efforts have no hope of succeeding. Boy, the hearing of God, the help of God. You know, when I think about Nehemiah, he was in one place and his burden was, uh, what God had burdened him for was many, 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 many miles away. When I think about the two cities, he was in a place of um, riches and the other was poor. He was in a place that was strong, stronghold there, you might say, and the other was weak. I mean, he was in a place of pride and comfort, and another was depressed, broken. Those with a burden seek the help of the God of heaven, recognizing his supreme authority and ability can accomplish what men alone cannot. I read this, we are fit for the work of God only when we've wept over it, prayed about it, and then we are able by Him to tackle the job that needs to be done. You know, may God give us that burden. May God give us hearts 
that, that bleed and eyes that are open to see and minds that are clear to interpret God's purpose. Wills that are obedient to what He wants us to do. And a determination that's unflinching. As it said about the task that He would have us to do. You know, I, verse 5 says... And said, I beseech thee, O God. Nehemiah begins that prayer. O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Let thine ear now be attentive and thy eyes open that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant which I pray before thee now day and night for the children of Israel thy servants and confess the sins of the children of Israel which we have sinned against thee both I and my father's house have sinned. We have dealt very corruptly against thee and have not kept the commandments nor the statutes nor the judgments which the commandments uh, uh, thou servant Moses, remember, I beseech thee the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, if you transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. In verse 9 of his prayer, but if ye turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, though thereof you cast out unto the uttermost part of the heaven, Yet I will gather them from thence, and I will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there. Now these are thy servants and thy people, whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power and by thy strong hand. Verse 11, O Lord, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive unto the prayer of thy servants, and to the prayer of thy servants who desire to fear thy name and prosper. I pray thee, thy servant this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. Wow, what a prayer. What a prayer. Nehemiah was burdened. Nehemiah got a true burden over bringing honor and glory to God. And that burden in the sense of that, that those days of mourning and that time of fasting and then this time of prayer, it became evident through that to Nehemiah what God's task for him to do was. I wonder, I wonder, as you think about where a burden person starts and what a burden person sees and who a burdened person seeks. I wonder about our burdens. Now, I'm not talking about those loads we want to cast off that I mentioned earlier. I'm not talking about that difficulty and that trial that affects our flesh and we carry around. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about what God's placed on you as a child of God to accomplish for His honor and glory. Where do we start? What do we see? Who do we seek? I trust you'll take the words of Nehemiah and apply those to your life. That you'll be broken over the needs that are out there. That you'll see the shame and reproach it brings upon our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And that you'll seek God in prayer to give you wisdom and strength and ability to accomplish what He wants you to do. I don't know what your need is this evening. I don't know that. But I know that in the troubling times we're in, there are people that have needs. And oh, that God would burden our hearts to do what we are able to do with His help and strength. Maybe someone listening this evening that doesn't know the Lord as their Savior, oh, yeah, you get a different kind of burden. I can't imagine not knowing that I was going to spend eternity in a place called heaven. We're under that, that weight of sin. Jesus wants you saved. Ask Him to forgive you of your sins and come into your heart and save you. Don't let another day pass by 
without Jesus Christ. Call on Him this evening while you still can. We're going to have a word of prayer. And as we, as we pray, I ask you, call on Christ. Get the help you need. Ask God to clarify your burden, Christian, what He'd have you to do. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. I thank you for just these few verses in Nehemiah and the, the burden that was placed on him and the call was there on his life. Lord, I pray you'd help each one of us to realize we're here for a reason. You've got something for us to do. Many of us, you've already equipped, you've already given the resources, maybe the talents and abilities. And with your help and guidance, you've got something you want us to accomplish. Help us to be sensitive to that. Lord, if there's one lost, I pray right now they call on you for salvation, admit they're a sinner, ask you to forgive them of their sins and come into their heart and save them. Lord, please, while there's still time, thank you for this wonderful day you've given us. We give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Well, thank you so much. Today's been a wonderful day uh, being able to worship outside this morning, then back uh, online and through Facebook and YouTube this evening. I trust it was a, a blessing to you and that we'll uh, recognize as we, as we spoke about uh, it, it begins, it begins with a burden, it begins with a burden. God bless you. And, and until the next time.